Welcome, Pathfinders, to the Find the Path Tales from Dark Moon Vale Campfire Chat. Yeah. Our first oh. after party. Welcome. We're making s'mores, y'all. Mm. Aw, s'mores. I mean, we are in Andorin, so that actually f- kind of fits. Yes, Andorin, birthplace of s'mores. True. <laughs> and freedom. And I'm uh, I'm going to roast some sausage and get some, uh, mm. I don't know, mashed potatoes. <laughs> you know what? Never mind. Yeah, no, I just <laughs> got the citronella candles, you know, just around the camp, so to save us from the bug. Oh, 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 one of those tins of popcorn. Yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah, there you go. Oh, yes. Fun. The Jiffy Pop. Nice. Yeah. I will say, like, some hard apple cider. Every time that I play Grimm, I actually really want some hard apple cider. That actually mm. sounds nice. You should get some. Sounds refreshing. You shouldn't say that. I, I have a feeling fans might send you hard apple cider. It's good. Uh, yeah, actually, it is. Don't yeah, any of our East Coast, cider. like the send New England, New England area knows how to do that. Canada also really knows how to. I've read a lot on hard apple cider recently <laughs> <laughs> to get into character. <laughs> uh, well, if you oh, ever yeah, make your own, I'm sure that's what it was right? about. <laughs> if you ever make your own, call it Regicider. <laughs> regicider. <laughs> that's true. Yes, yeah, Regicider baby. for sure. Woo. We already have a label. At any rate, we're uh, we're enjoying some campfire over here, uh, just in the middle of Dark Moon Vale. I'm sure it's perfectly safe. Come join us sure. by the campfire. Safe. And we're going to tell some creepy stories, like, or are you afraid of the dark? Mm-hmm. Oh, sure. nice. Although, to be fair, there's plenty of things to be afraid of the dark in this world. There Especially in Dark Moon Vale. <laughs> true. Yeah, right? I am afraid of we're Dark one, Moon Vale. We're one step away from becoming the last of us here, so. Yeah, <laughs> true. Oh, yeah. Gracious. Yeah, that's enough to be afraid of. But that yeah. was also like a fungal thing. Yeah, yeah true. That's, that's, it's a whole cordyceps thing coming for us. I mean, granted, the real monsters were the people. That's uh, always the case. Sure. I mean, that's yeah. always the real monster. Yeah. Turns out it's man. But however, uh, let's go ahead and get a brief recap, starting with episode one. You may recall episode one where we introduce the the fine folks at Find the Path with their brand new characters. Grim, Astrea, Amaranth, Celestine, and Clove. I couldn't remember your name for like half a second there. <laughs> Better known uh, as Team Foxtrot. Yes. That's what we decided, <laughs> Team Foxtrot. Are okay. we Team Foxtrot? I guess so. Oh, yeah, that's right, because we're, we're not like the A-team. <laughs> but we also saved a fox. You did? That's true. Yeah, there we go. So it That was fits. later on, yes. though. Uh, however, in episode one, we introduced the cast of characters, each of them uh, having a brief vignette about their current daily lives. Things are not looking good, by the way, in Dark Moon Vale. Not at nope. all. There's some like some shenanigans going on. <laughs> yeah. First of all, let's talk a bit about Black Scour and kind of how that whole thing's going on. So I know that uh, at the very least, one NPC that is important to a party member already has it. I'm sorry, Grimster. Yeah, I know. Uh, yeah. That's what I got for or get for giving myself an adorable granddaughter. Yep. How dare you? Uh, <laughs> you should have done what I did and killed everyone off. Just what Grimm needs, more tragedy. Mm. <laughs> this kind of yeah. makes me picture, like, interview with a vampire. She's the, uh, yeah. what was it, Claudia? Claudia. Yeah, yeah. Claudia. Yeah. Except much more wholesome than Claudia ever was. Well, Claudia was wholesome in, like, <laughs> the first, like, five seconds of meeting her. Well, okay, yes. And then she went downhill after that. I mean, that's what happens when you live with two vampires. Yeah. Forever and ever. Yeah. Um, but beyond that, all of you had met up with Laurel in Roots and Remedies. Yes. She's mixing up some sort of cure. So uh, what I want, one question I have for all of you, what do you make of the cure? How effective do you think it's going to be? I mean, Celestine's pretty much like, well, it's the only shot we've got. Might as well give it a go. <laughs> But you're I not think it's expecting gonna be super anything. helpful. It's weird because everything else we've tried I'm a, hasn't worked. So yeah, this super weird recipe in this random book's totally surely gonna work. She's kind of pessimistic. Mm. <laughs> so Clove seems to be much more optimistic. <laughs> Clove 100% thinks it's going to work. I think Amaranth is hoping that it will work, but unfortunately doesn't know anything about you know herbalism or anything like that to really know like if it could work. So you know he's he's probably sitting there going, "Man, I really should have instead of studying art, I should have studied herbology." Mm. Always studying yeah, herbology th- as a wizard. Neville was right. <laughs> yes. Yep. Yeah, I think Estrella is is hoping. Like she she's probably more optimistic. She doesn't know much about any of that, but she's willing to try. Hmm. Grim. Grim does trust in the healing ability of people in addition to the healing ability of the gods, and he's more confident in it after learning that it includes dwarven mushrooms. 
Not true. <laughs> that was really the only qualifier. Those for mushrooms. Needed. Oh, there's dwarven mushrooms in it. That'll that'll fix it right up. Yeah, I don't know. Do or treat you real drunk. We're not sure. <laughs> why not both? Yeah, why not both? You know, you got to go through the whole healing process. I'm sure you got to like get high or something first. To sweat <laughs> yeah, I guess out. you've got to get high or something first. Rachel Sandage, <laughs> <That's a> 2020. <laughs> 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 Something's got to get us through 2020. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever you need to get first. through 2020 is acceptable, pretty much it's for the true. most part. Honestly, you know, that the, you know those mushrooms are high in fiber, so that's yeah. all part of a, a good dwarven balanced breakfast mixed fiber in. Fiber and curious. iron, it seems. Nothing ever came from eating too much iron. Sure, never. Not true. Except Not that one once. scene in that X Men movie where uh, Magneto pulled all the iron out of a guy. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. that yeah. was actually yeah. one of the coolest scenes of the movie. That was a really cool scene. And uh, from there, you set out. When you were beset upon by a hobgoblin, though I believe you didn't know that at the time, and that brings us directly mm. to episode two. Where we murdered I, that hobgoblin dead. I did have a question <laughs> for you, Ross. Yes. And let me know if this is uh, if this is me as a as a lowly player trying to dig too much behind <laughs> the hey! screens hey! of a GM. Okay. Okay. First off, you're a Controlling. dwarf, you know all about digging too deep. <laughs> and That's fair. we are not lowly, sir. Yeah, I take offense to that. <laughs> I'm putting myself in that category. That doesn't make doesn't it make any it better. better. <laughs> You're still insulting us. Yeah. Because in episode one, we did learn that the mushrooms are underneath a monastery dedicated to an evil dwarven god. Mm-hmm. Which out in the middle of Dark Moon Vale just kind of struck me as I, I like. I know uh, Drosker's Crag is just to the north of uh, Dark Moon Vale area. Was that like is that straight from the book or was that monastery repurposed for dwarvenness because there's a dwarf in the party? So, you know, what, let me go on ahead and tell you that the monastery being dedicated to Drosker is in fact an original part of the book. Nice. Wow! Wow! Nice! Yeah. Nice. They had uh, done quite a bit of background even back then. But I will also let yeah. you know that it wasn't originally a Drosgar monastery. Okay, well that's awesome. I'm I'm glad they're including that. But uh, we'll we'll yeah. you'll f- be able to find out more about it as you, well, start exploring it whenever that happens. I think you mentioned in the first episode that it was originally a, mo- a monastery dedicated to Torag and then moved over to the Drosgar worship during yes. the. Uh, what is it? Tarkadum, I believe, was the na- was the period when the dwarves fell under a king who worshipped Drosgar yeah. and basically enslaved the dwarves of the Five Kings Mountains. Mm-hmm. Well, that sounds like fun. Oh, yeah. Good times. <laughs> I like that Heather and I were both just like, for uh-huh. the For the Draugr. <laughs> Woo. Wait, waiting for that. I understood that reference part because that's like totally I foreign. Mean, I've, I've delved extensively into the dwarven lore. Yeah. Uh, especially in preparation for making deep? this character. Uh, I did not dig too greedily. That's the important thing. Yeah, <laughs> true. Balrogs are attracted to greed. They're oh, much man. like Sin Spawn in that way. Yes. <laughs> Haha, Pathfinder joke. All right. Uh, anyway, no, I'm, I'm very excited about that. Yeah. My favorite part of that fight was getting to climb a tree and kick a guy. That was, I like yeah. being trained in unarmed strikes automatically. That's very fun. Yeah, that's a really helpful thing because I always feel like, I felt like in first edition you needed to be trained in unarmed strikes to be an adventurer. Mm. I will point out one thing too. If you had actually managed to bring the Hobgoblin to zero hit points with that strike, you actually wouldn't have killed it because unarmed strikes normally do non-lethal damage. Interestingly ah. enough, they've actually changed the way non-lethal damage works. Yes. So it doesn't it doesn't track as a separate pool. It's just that if an attack brings you to zero hit points and it was non-lethal, you're knocked out instead of killed or wounded ah. slash dying. Just to let you know cool. for the future. It didn't come up huh. because he still has some hit points remaining after you hit him. But yeah, it could have. Now we know we can kick things unconscious if we so desire. <laughs> if we really yeah. need to interrogate them, everybody drop your swords and just start punching. It <laughs> makes more sense because bar fights and accidentally beating people to death, you know. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. I mean, you can I still beat someone this. to death if you just keep wailing on them while they're unconscious. But that seems pretty awful. So I don't recommend. Yeah. None of us are evil here. We well, I mean, Clove did continue to, like, kick him dun, when dun, he was dun. dead, but she was raging. Well, yeah, I think she was less trying to kick his uh, rib cage into his lungs and more just, like, generally kicking around him. Fair. The interesting thing I found with, like, the, the non-lethal rules was that you can you can do non-lethal with any weapon that is lethal by taking a minus two penalty now, so the mm-hmm. penalty isn't as bad as it used to be. And you can also deal lethal damage with any non-lethal weapon by taking a minus two penalty. Yep. Huh. huh. 
It works both so ways. So if you're punching someone, you can still choose to punch them to death. Has some sort of <laughs> ability at first level that makes all of their punches and crap lethal without if the they penalty. Choose, yes. Yeah. Yeah, they can still switch back and forth like monks in first edition. Yeah, I haven't dug much into the monks. So. Yeah, neither have I. That's why I, I did was a curious. brief read over, so I don't. I admit I'm not an expert, but I am trained. And ah, there then he saved the little fox that he was I using know. as bait. It was cute. That honestly, I knew from the moment that that fox was included that the FTP crew was absolutely going to fuss over it for at least half an episode. Well, that's hi. that's the thing that we would like go to the ends of the earth to, and die on a hill for it's is true. is you know saving a trapped animal. Here's my question. <laughs> Were we the dinner or was the fox the dinner? You were the dinner. That is a good question. The fox okay, so he was a cannibal. Okay. Yeah, no, he actually trapped the fox specifically to try to get travelers and passersby to come help it. So then he could kill oh. them and eat them. Well, he was well, a jerk and he's dead now. <laughs> you were able to help the Firefoot fox on its way. Um, did Yay. any of you give it a name? Yeah. I don't actually recall. I don't think we named it. Yeah, no. That's okay. no, it's a creature we of the wild. we weren't keeping him. Yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. He, he needs to be free. He has his own name. He knows it. Mm-hmm. I'm sure if Estrella ever calls this story to somebody, she'll probably give him a name, and it'll <laughs> change every time just because of whatever her mood is. Aww. His name was Kit Harrington. <laughs> <laughs> uh, see, it's funny because uh, kits are also... Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> yeah, from there, you then traveled onward, heading toward the oldest tree in the forest... When you got there, you actually saw an unusual beast, which you found out later was a river drake. Though this one was yeah, covered I'm, in fungal I'm spores. I'm sad it wasn't a fungus dragon. Yeah, well. <laughs> Is that a thing? A fungus dragon? Who knows? No, but it should have been. <laughs> River Drake is fun. This episode gave off severe Fern Gully vibes, and that yes. was so yes. cool. Mm. <laughs> Super cool. Whole, it's very feely that way. You can absolutely make a plant monster that looks like a dragon if you want to. Like, I'm interested in trying to do that in second edition because I think that would be fun. Mm. Yeah, I guess that's true because you have that. Uh, I think there was like a topiary or something in first edition that was yeah. like a living topiary. So you could do something like that and just be like, it's it's shaped like a dragon. Well, they have animated trees. So I imagine you could just have an animated bush that's trimmed in a certain thing. Yeah, yeah well, it's topiary. Or just a leshy that looks like a dragon. Yeah. Uh, but but yeah, so now we're afraid the water source is contaminated because this mm-hmm. dragon definitely had the disease. And what? this brings us to episode three, where you actually confronted the Drake. Uh, you did end up destroying it, though it didn't seem to give you much of a choice. Unfortunately. We were almost, a little bit sad about it. It, it almost uh, killed. And we found a dead body. Yes, you did. Yeah, sure. two, right? Two. Two. Or was it two just dead one? bodies. Two dead bodies. So, yeah, I uh, did actually almost kill Estrella, if I remember correctly, which I think was Jessica yes. was about to say. Yeah, it, it messed me up pretty good. Yeah. So second edition is still pretty deadly. I will let you know, too, that that was a creature level two. So it was technically mm. above Ooh. your you know, pay grade, though not by a large I amount. Mean, <laughs> it did kind of make sense for her character. Uh, I mean, we don't know much about her character yet, but let's just say that while she has trained with a sword a lot, she hasn't had a lot of like real life experience with mm, it. <laughs> fun. <laughs> what you need to do is just get yourself some rage and you just blindly <laughs> hit things as hard as you can. You did ultimately destroy it, though, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Australia got the killing blow. <laughs> yeah, I did. And then turned around and burned the body because it's contaminated with black scour. But yeah, dev- yeah. Uh, second edition is pretty devastating. Everything hits really hard. It yeah. does. All the numbers are really high. So this is another interesting uh, point that I want to point out is that river drakes are normally a creature level three, but I went ahead and applied the weak template to it. Because so, it was oh, it had black yeah. scour. Mm. Um, so I sense. hope that it was appropriate, but not, I guess, not overtaxing. I mean, I, I was, was a little no, worried about good. Estrella for a minute, but yeah. That's fine. Yeah, but it was one of those things that it didn't seem insurmountable. Like, it was one of those, you know, like sometimes you go into a fight and you're like, I really need to flee right now. Like, this wasn't one of those fights. It didn't Mm. feel like. All right. Good to know. But you gathered the moss on the tree uh, and then made your way to Olametsa's hut, where I believe you... Well, you you did a number of things to try to get inside the hut, which uh, (laughs) brought us into some interesting skill checks. Yep. True. (laughs) <laughs> yeah. And then we get in there and Ulametsa's not there. Nope. No, but Ulam- there was a turnip. There Her was a turnip. There. 
Yeah. Yeah, and then she had her cauldron oh. that tried to bludgeon everyone to death. That yeah, what remains of, of her cauldron was pretty cool. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm interested though in who set up the like dummy body and barred the door. Yeah, I kind of wonder did like Ulametsa like just abandon the place? And but that seems unlikely because like a lot of her stuff was still there. Or did like somebody kidnap her and set it up? I don't know. Like it's hmm. it's very mysterious. Or maybe she was midway through transformation into a turnip headed fleshy. Ooh. And then we murdered her. Oops. <laughs> Our bad. No, don't undo True. the ra- oh. oh no, oh no, I wait. Oh. I've got a great theory. She sets up this dummy thing in case anybody breaks into her house because like she can't lock the door. And she closes the door, and then the latch goes down, and she's, like, you know, too old or frail to not, like, climb up and go through the top like uh, Australia did. Was that a bookcase? Yeah, it was a bookcase. Oh, it was a bookcase, yeah. I don't know. An earthquake happens, and it was covered. I don't know. (laughs) And she just is like, well, guess I'm homeless now, and then trots off. (laughs) That was the end of my story. That is a very bad theory. I don't agree. I see that Jordan's razor strikes again. (laughs) Whatever the most complicated answer is (laughs) must be the truth. (laughs) There's no other way to open up that hut, either. Mud and stick are just too tough of a material. Too strong. (laughs) Yes. Are you a witch or aren't you? (laughs) (laughs) Well, apparently he can't remember. (laughs) Apparently she's a turnip. Sure. Uh, Which makes me wonder if she was a princess in disguise, because, you know, the last time there was a turnip head, he was a prince. Mm, That's true. true. Watch your Miyazaki, folks. (laughs) So I did have a question in that fight. Clove, I think you was raging, and at one point you said something like, well, I didn't choose to come here. And it was, like, really weird because, like, you did choose to come here, so what's up with that? Clove is a spirit barbarian, and first of all, I know that barbarians don't have to rage for a whole minute, but I like the flavor of that because spirit barbarians have kind of a possession thing. And so when she's raging, she's not really herself. Oh. I assume we'll get into more of what or slash who you are later. Hopefully. Like what like mm. what the spirit is, maybe? Yeah, my idea is like anytime she rages to use that last 30 seconds or whatever before she switches back to kind of give some of that information. Hmm. Okay. Interesting. Okay, Okay, because like I know that you said like you described her, her rage is like she goes pale, which didn't really seem like you get enraged because usually you would get redder if you're getting enraged. Yeah, I have her rage kind of works off of fear. So like she was startled by the the hammer hitting the cauldron. And so that triggered her rage because she was scared and like. Oh, that's that's kind of an interesting like way of doing a barbarian because it's like a totally different way than we you know because it's literally the ability is called rage you know so mm. it's I mean the the thing that possesses her is mad about it yeah 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 like how dare you scare my little human and a lot of times rage and anger comes out of a place of fear like when people are angry a lot of times it's because they're ultimately scared look at you getting all philosophical over here yeah, yeah. all right <laughs> I had to take my barbarian to an interesting place. Yes. yes, we must all remember that fear leads to anger, and then anger leads to hate. Hate. And then hate leads to suffering. Yes. Yes. Which I think yes, leads to fear again. I'm pretty sure <laughs> that leads to Hayden Christensen's performance in Star Wars, which made us all suffer. <laughs> Except sand <laughs> leads to hate. Hate leads to... Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> uh, That's where the truth. From my point come. of view, the Jedi are not... You know, yeah. <laughs> just course and gets everywhere. <laughs> Ooh, we, we also breezed over the fact that some random guy showed up at Celestine's house and was like stalking her or something? <laughs> hmm. Yeah. Oh. Well, none of us know about that. Yeah. I know. Uh, yeah, we, we, that was a vignette. We didn't get to but know like, about that. Here's my fan theory. My fan theory is that Celestine is somehow related to the Lumber Consortium boss guy. Oh, yeah. You're okay, like the boss's yeah, daughter. I, I got that vibe huh? as well. Look hmm. at Heather. That, that's it. It's no, an interesting theory. I mean, She's hiding behind her box because she knows it's true. No, <laughs> I'm hiding behind this stupid box because it's the only place on my desk that will fit. <laughs> I would like to point out that that box was made with love. No, and it was made by a key box. <laughs> No, we'll probably get more into that uh, later about Celestine's history with the Lumber Consortium. Those mm. jerks. Mm. I think several of you have some history with the Lumber Consortium, though. Mm-hmm. We generally just hate them. Yeah, they're not nice we people. We being us. 
Us from the town don't particularly like them. I find myself as ambivalent as a paladin can be about an evil organization. <laughs> uh, which is mostly they have I know nothing the law about them whatsoever. Yeah. <laughs> What's up with your wizard? Why doesn't he know any magic? <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you kind of the reason why I went kind of the way that I did, and then we'll get into the specifics of, like, why the character went that way. He studied art and forgot. (laughs) It's one of those things where, like, okay, you're a 200-year-old wizard. Why are you just now learning magic, right? Like, why are you still a first-level wizard? So I... I've done this once before where it's like a they've just now started using their powers or something like that. But like I kind of wanted to go in a different tack this time and go, wouldn't it be kind of weird and different if he was a once accomplished wizard, but he's just like gotten lazy? <laughs> it's like, eh. Uh, this magic uh, this magic is so common to me, it's now boring. Spell kind of spells. It's like a midlife crisis for a you know, 200 year old wizard. <laughs> Interesting. Midlife crisis means I'm not practicing magic anymore. I'm going to look at this art. Ooh, question for Ross. What is oh. Reggie going to sound like when Reggie gets oh to Oh my gosh. Thing? What is Reggie yeah. going to sound Don't like? Don't tell us, Ross. It has to be a surprise. Squeak. <laughs> Why no, am I gonna, squeak, oh squeak. my god, it's gonna be like Kronk. Squeak. Squeaker squeak. Squeak, squeak. <laughs> oh my gosh. I may have I'm to borrow it. that for when they're talking. I do actually have a question for you, Ross, from that first episode, because I think ah. at some point Jessica mentioned wanting to reach out or hold the uh sugar glider. Mm. And you said that he retreats away and lets out a squeak. Yes. Was that a Baldur's Gate reference? That's immediately where I mind, my mind went. Maybe. <laughs> okay, yes. <laughs> nice. I love and it. For those of us who don't play Baldur's Gate, what? <laughs> Minsk, the ranger that you can get on your team, who also has severe ha- head injury, has a hamster, which he phrases is a miniature giant space hamster, which occupies one of his inventory slots. And if you try to click on it or try to remove it from his inventory, it says that the hamster scuttles away and that Minsk looks at you angrily. And then the hamster little icon makes a squeak noise every time you click on it. Is that why Commander Shepard has a space hamster? Has a space uh-huh. hamster, yes. 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 It's, it's a reference to that. made them both, yes. It's... <laughs> okay. So Commander mm-hmm. Shepard's space hamster is a reference to Baldur's Gate's miniature giant space hamster. Mm-hmm. Interesting. So that one's for you, Minx. Also, 90s I love reference. Her. <laughs> I just want Reggie Squeak. to have like the deepest voice ever now. <laughs> Squeak. <laughs> But now we are on our way to the Dwarven Monastery of an evil Dwarven God, where I'm sure nothing bad will happen at all. No, why yeah, would it? We'll just, no, we're going to walk We'll in, just find these mushrooms need, and head back fine. to the city. It's fine. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. It's fine. Totally fine. There won't no. be any creepy, like, lake monsters or Balrogs coming up Dwarven from the Dwarven cult. No. I'm calling it. Dwarven yeah, cult. No. No, if I can, I actually, I have a question pertaining towards our whole break-in and everything else of the witch's hut and all the rest of that that happened, which... Uh, funny enough, is something that probably the entire audience knows by this point, and I guess I could look it up myself, but I don't know it personally. Grim is, of course, lawful good, mm-hmm. which is why he exhausted every other option before resort- resorting to breaking in, mostly just to check and see if that witch is okay. Yeah. I'm kind of curious about everyone else's views <laughs> as far as alignment are concerned, because we haven't really gotten a chance to delve into people's alignments yet. It was abandoned. Also, I'm, K- I'm neutral good, so I was just like, you know what? People of the town need this. This lady is probably dead because I knew that she had given the grandmother of my, you know, mentor the book. So I, she was probably dead. And the place looked like it was falling apart. So Clove was just like, you know what? We're just going to get in here and get this thing. And if she's in here, we'll say sorry and help her fix her house or whatever. But she didn't answer the knock. Yeah. And I think for Amaranth, he's neutral good. And so it's one of those cases where we... We did have, I guess, to use the legal terminology, probable cause to believe that she was in some mm-hmm. type of distress. Or dead. And or dead. Um, yeah, so he, he felt it was justifiable. Celestine's chaotic good. We're trying to help the town and what we need's in that building. Let's just go. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think Estrella is probably more in line with Grimm's thing. Like, we should make sure that we're not, like, barging into this poor lady's house. But she had no problem, like, climbing up onto the roof to check inside like that was okay because she assessed the situation and now it is okay to go inside are you another lawful good or i'm not lawful good because she does not always follow the law but we'll learn about that later hmm. rachel continues KG. to hide her alignment KG. Oh, I'm neutral good. 
Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, there he goes. Okay, I was like, neutral good friend? Is that you? We're mostly so, neutral good in this party. Yeah, lots yeah. of neutral good I'm sensing. Except for one chaotic and one lawful. Yeah, I sense a continue growing divide between my approach and Heather's approach to things. <laughs> Never. The three of us say, will be the I was going to say, the good news is we all balance out because we have one lawful, one chaotic, and a bunch of neutrals. So it's all yeah. balanced. Yeah. The way, you Chemistry. know, the, like the force or whatever. Like an ion or something. Yes. Yeah, again, it was. I found it kind of funny because we're trying, like Heather and I, keep trying to hold the line together and do all the rest of this stuff, but our, mecha- our the mechanics of our characters are opposed. Yep. <laughs> Where I need, I need to her flank. to be within five feet of me, but she needs me to be at least ten feet away. <laughs> <laughs> so this is like, no, this you. isn't happening. This brings it's me true. to an interesting question, though, which I think the entire group might be interested in answering. You had a chance to at least get some combat in with your characters. Uh, what's a major thing you find different playing a second edition version of your class from a first edition version? It still feels like Pathfinder, but the three action economy makes maneuvering around the battlefield and being able to actually do something way more effective. Mm. But I still feel like I'm playing a rogue. I still need to get in the flank. I still do sneak attack and all that stuff. So it's not like it's different, but not so different that I'm like, what is happening? I feel like I have a lot of different options. Given I played a Barbarian for like six levels at my first AP ever in first edition and didn't like how Rage worked. So I like how Rage works a lot better in second edition. Mm -hmm. It's a lot more to the point. There's less like do a bunch of math and then do some more math. And like after 15 minutes, you're ready to go. (laughs) But you also kind of have a lot of flexibility because like you can move, you can like grab a thing, you can hit something, you can try to hit it again. So it is like Heather was saying, you're a lot more nimble, kind of. Yeah, it's the it's the fluidity of the battle because there's not like you don't have a tax opportunity, so you don't have that thing where well, like you lock some in. Some people with, do. Well, yeah, but most likely you're you're gonna you know in first edition everybody has a tax opportunity. You're gonna lock in and kind of dance around each other, but you're not really gonna have like huge moves around the battlefield. Whereas now, since only some classes have attack of opportunity or some creatures have attack of opportunity. You can do more like maneuvering to get into an ideal position instead of saying, well, nope, I'm locked in. I got a five foot step my way around. But as a wizard, I can cast a spell that is useful every single round, um, which it didn't feel necessarily in first level in first edition. It was between do I shoot my crossbow and have a chance of doing a D8 of damage or do I cast acid splash and do a D3? But now it's like, no, it's definitely better for me to go ahead and, and do the, uh, you know, electric arc or produce flame or some spell like that. Cantrips are good. The cantrips are really, really good in for, in second edition, and I appreciate that as a wizard. Rachel, um, you played a bunch of fighters. I, I ha- have, actually. <laughs> uh, I tend to like my, my fighter characters. Uh, the best thing is probably the three-action economy. I've really enjoyed that. Like, being able to say, hey, I attack. Oh, wait, I can go ahead and attack I get, you know, so yeah. that's that's nice. The only thing so far that I don't like about second edition is bulk. I prefer the weight system yeah. because I feel like it was easier to manage. Um, it, yeah, but we'll see how yeah. that goes the longer we go. I agree. I kind of have two thoughts on it. Like where on one hand, uh, I, I'll be perfectly honest. I haven't really gotten to explore much of what Grim can do because I have rolled atrociously for almost mm. all of my initiatives. Oh. and don't tend to get to act very much. So I haven't been able to use my reactions for much of anything. But that being said, I have been seeing a lot of use of lay on hands, which I like the focus spell elements. I I was going to say, I love the fact that you can just rest for 10 minutes and do that again. Yeah, I was actually just about to say that. Yeah, that's that's really cool, because, I mean, it would make sense. Like if you could kind of recoup yourself. I mean, if you were traveling through the forest, you could stop and rest. It makes sense. But you don't necessarily need eight hours of rest in order to kind of get yourself back going. And in a strange way, it makes me feel more paladin-like. Yeah. Where my yeah. character finishes up a battle and then prays and thanks to his deity and asks for strength for the battles to come. Like, it gives me a mechanical benefit for praying, which is just sort of neat. Yeah. I do have one observation that wasn't combat-related, but it's a mechanic-related mm-hmm. thing. And this will probably yeah. be a little bit of controversial view even amongst this table. I kind of like the fewer languages available. Oh, see, like I, having a language. I hate that. This is where I'm getting into because I knew Heather's response would that <laughs> be like that. But like when you're just brought up, it's like, OK, and then it's goblin stuff. And it's like, oh, I know goblin or actually having someone else in the same in the same party that speaks dwarven. Mm-hmm. It's just like that's really neat because now it's a special thing. My characters yeah. always yeah. wind up being language monkeys. 
because we need them as we as the AP progresses, you know, like, you know, in Mummy's Mask, Ancient Osiriani ended up being really important and things like that. So the fact that I can't get very many, like I almost took the extra languages like skill feat at first level just because I was like, I only have three. What is happening? <laughs> I, I mean, have one I, language, y'all. Yeah, I've got six, but that's because I have a high intelligence. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's I think interesting it makes that sense though. Yeah, I mean, you're right. It's yeah. it's interesting that there are still ways to get additional languages, but it costs you more as a character build than it did in first edition. Well, and they also they codified uh, when you gain your stat points if you put one into if you put one of your stat boosts at fifth level into intelligence, it also gives you a language. Yeah. Like they codified that if your intelligence ever goes up, you gain the additional language as well. I think I like that though because if you think about actual language acquisition, like some of these adventure paths, yeah. you could pick up a new language every week or two. And that's not super realistic. So I mean, you can you can do the whole like retcon thing of oh, I've been studying this for some time, but like, it's kind of more I think a more realistic reflection of you're not going to be good at learning three languages at once. Like I don't know anybody who'd be decent wait, at doing that even. Wait, you you can't do that. <laughs> Sorry, well, I gotta I rub it in, either. Ross. Jeez. <laughs> Honestly, I'm hey, not right any in the good sensitive at it spot. <laughs> I feel a slight yeah because there is that kind of camaraderie between Grim and Celestine because she actually like she knows his language. You know, so it's like you, you bothered to learn my language. There's an appreciation. And as a player, mm-hmm. I know how valuable that language is. <laughs> <laughs> Plus, it makes certain divinatory spells more valuable, too. Yeah. All right. Well, let's go on ahead and uh, let's do something that's kind of a fun tradition here at Find the Path. What I'm going to do is ask all the players to go in a round table. And you know what? Let's go on ahead and cast your character. So we'll start with Jessica and Clove. Clove is played by... Saoirse Ronan, because she can simultaneously look a little innocent, but she also is really good at being kind of a sassy teenager. Like, I, I saw that movie where she played a teenager. What was that movie called? Lady Bird? Lady Bird, yeah. I saw hmm. Lady Bird. She's so, the one with, like, like, the great Irish accent. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah she's Irish. Yeah. Uh, yeah, okay. Cersei, I know her from that's Atonement. A, Atonement's yeah. good, too, yeah. Definitely an Irish so That's who man. I've got, Saoirse Ronan. All right. Jordan, what about Amaranth? Oh, I wasn't prepared for this. Um, Chaucer from A Knight's Tale, Rachel. Oh, uh, oh my God! Now that you ask me, I was I was taking his name. Hang Jeff, on. Uh, Jeffrey Chaucer it's... is. Uh, oh my God, brain! Oh, Hang right, on, married to Jennifer Connelly. I, I love him. <laughs> Paul Bettany. Paul Bettany. Paul Bettany. Yes, thank is. you. Oh my okay. God. God. I had that moment where I was like, I had a panic moment where I was like, I know we had this conversation already, and I cannot remember who I said. Okay. I kept thinking like of all of his characters he was playing, and I was yeah. like, no, 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 no. What's his actual name? <laughs> you could have just said Vision. Yeah, but I think of his naked, <laughs> and I think of Chaucer. That, that's what I think of. When yes. I think of Paul Bettany. Yes, that was such a good movie. It is still one of my favorites. Paul Bettany's a total sex symbol. Um, okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah, he is. Sorry. <laughs> I killed Ross. <laughs> I take great pleasure I've in died. this. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> just, this is just the reality you know, of Jessica's life. I read Chaucer. <laughs> I'm just like, now every time I think of Chaucer, I'm just thinking of it. Anyway. <laughs> well, he plays Chaucer in Nightsdale. Anyway, Jordan, Amaranth. So Amaranth would be played in the movie adaptation by the wonderful Paul Bettany. Oh. Little British, looks great in glasses. Like Inkheart. Mm-hmm. Inkheart? He was an in Inkheart and he had like longer he hair. I don't know what Inkheart is. In her Give him some elf ears and, and there you go. Yeah, there you go. So Paul Bettany with some ears and a nice pair of shades. <laughs> uh, n- nice pair of shades? shades? No, a nice pair of uh, glasses on. <laughs> He's wearing them pince-nez, y'all. Yeah, the, oh, yeah, yeah, I was going to say, totally yeah, those were the pince-nez, so... <laughs> You just said shades and all I picture is we just show up. It's like, so what you are saying is the witch of the West is dead. And then he pulls out the shades and puts them on. <laughs> all I heard was Squirtle Squad. Squirtle Squad. I don't know why. When you have squirtle shades squad. on, I think of Squirtle Squad shades. Well, he's got a squirrel, so. He's got a squirrel. squirrel. It, I was thinking uh, that he must have magic on them to make them transition lenses. lenses. Oh, and so he's like, very he's like, yeah, he's stepping outside and he's just darkens and it's just like, yes, magic still works in this world. All right. <laughs> you realize you have to invest those, right? So that counts against your limit. 
Whoopsie. <laughs> also, I think the nerdier version is to have the clip-ons that clip oh, no, onto yeah. your glasses <laughs> and then oh, no, the clip-ons <laughs> on his pince-nez, the clip-on additional ones. <laughs> I feel personally attacked there because I used to do that. <laughs> oh, no, me too, Ross, me too. Like Everyone 100%. did that in the 90s. Back in high school, but yes. <laughs> I hate to break this to you, Ross, but you're hosting a Pathfinder podcast. <laughs> Wait, You're what? The, the nerd ship when? has sailed. You may have outed yourself as a nerd. Uh, <laughs> well, you know what? I have many regrets. Many, many regrets. So many regrets. But this isn't one of them. You know what, Ross? I feel come. comfortable speaking for the crew. We think you're cool. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. I mean, you're probably the coolest out of all of us. Let's be real. <laughs> uh, yeah, with that, I, I think uh, let's move on to Heather and Celestine. Uh, Celestine would be played by uh, Natalie Dormer. And I just picture with oh. that trademark oh smirk my. anytime one of the consortium people come up and talk uh -huh. to her. That's just the see look it. on her face. With I the right brow it. and everything. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Plotting. I see. <laughs> All right, yeah. <laughs> and uh, next, Rachel, what about uh, what about Estrella? Uh, for Estrella, I chose, um, honestly, I've only ever seen her in, in one thing, and this is how much of an impression she made on me. From the God Complex episode of Doctor Who, um, oh, wow. she played Rita, the nurse. Oh. oh. And sh her charisma and whatever, I was just please let her be the next companion because she was just mm -hmm. awesome. Yeah. Um, and her name is uh, Amara Karan, but she's just fantastic in that. She's got this like quirky personality where you can tell that she's figuring stuff out. She's the one that's, you know, wants to do the best thing for everybody. And I felt like that kind of embodied what Estrella is trying to do. Nice. nice. Awesome. Is God Complex the one where they kidnap the hospital and like put it in like an asteroid no, or something No, it's the like one that. where they, they accidentally end up in the hotel where the different rooms show you your greatest fear. Mm. And they're being, like, hunted throughout the hotel by Which, this oh, doctor. that's a good, yeah, that's a good episode. Uh, Eleven. Oh, okay, Eleven. Okay. Yeah. So there, he's, like he's with episode. Amy Pond and, uh, and Rory, and they show up here, and the people that are actually there are, like, one by one dying off. And Okay, yeah. yes, I remember this now. It's, it's one of the best episodes I think they, they did for 11. And last and <laughs> certainly not least, Rick, uh, who's playing Grimm? So I'm pretty sure that anyone, because I'm pretty sure the moment I mentioned this actor, anyone that has looked at Grimm's art, which is uh, an amazing piece of artwork, but also amazingly captures the actor that I referenced for this artwork, <laughs> I think maybe more than any will know that Grimm is played by the one, the only, the phenomenal Sir Patrick Stewart. Yeah. Boy. And now yeah, that I've boy. said that, you cannot look at his artwork and not <laughs> see Patrick Stewart's amazing eyes staring soulfully into your heart. <laughs> it's true. Uh, artwork by Rachel Denton. Check by her out. Way. She's great. Yep. Yeah, she's awesome. Yeah. yeah. And uh, it, it captured the, the character art more than I could possibly imagine. And I... It is my favorite piece of art because it's just Patrick Stewart with this amazing beard. Mine will be drawn here. No further. <laughs> I'll be yeah. honest. Oh, I've seen Patrick God. Stewart with hair and it freaked me out. But Patrick Stewart with a beard yeah, it's is awesome. Yeah. yeah. Dude, yeah. Patrick Stewart is one of those guys that like rocks baldness to a level that I aspire to whenever I lose all my hair. All right, I my, wish I looked half as good. My favorite thing about Patrick Stewart is his relationship with Ian McKellen. Yes. Oh yeah. oh, yeah. Those that, are my favorite old men. I love that. Yes. Also, that and he does pit bull rescues, and he rescues pit bulls. He's a cute man. He's a him. great man. He was really good in Sherlock. Wasn't there some Sherlock thing where he was like an old Sherlock? No, that was Ian McKellen. Mm. Oh, sorry. Oh, yeah, no, that was Ian Never McKellen. Never mind. Mm. I, but I retract Ian that Ian McKellen statement. was amazing in that. He was. Mm. I just love them. They're like, when I get that old, I want to be that fun. Yes, I, I mean, think we sure all we aspire to be. I'm as planning fun on as dyeing my hair. Let, let's for be real. We're gonna all be, we all got to be in the same old folks' home so we can play Pathfinder together. <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> also, amazing Patrick Stewart performance. Even though I didn't actually like the movie that much because it adapted a whole bunch of stuff. Patrick Stewart in Macbeth, the movie. Mm. Like he delivers. Have you guys been watching him doing the read a sonnet a day thing since the quarantine started? Can't Some of them. I haven't, yeah, they're I haven't good. done them all. That man could read the phone book to me. <laughs> oh, yeah, totally. <laughs> Honestly, I'm hoping yeah. he does. 
All right. Well, I think from there, um, unless anybody else had any questions. Uh, I have an important thing that I think should be brought up. Yeah. Mm. Obviously, this would be a great opportunity to get your own thoughts read. So uh, if you would like maybe uh, to be read on the next Campfire Chat, why don't you uh, email us in with some questions, your thoughts, your uh, your feelings, what you think of, uh, of second edition of our approach on this, maybe of our characters, the stupid decisions we make. We <laughs> make intelligent decisions always. <laughs> I will not say anything one way or the other. Because you can't handle the truth. It's fine. (laughs) I fully accept who I am as a human being. Chaotic. Chaotic. Right in, Pathfolk. Yeah. Yes. Well, on that note, I suppose we'll leave it there for now, Pathfinders. So thank you uh, to from all of us here at the Campfire Chat. Thank you for listening. Thank you for tuning in. And we will see you all next time. Good luck. Good luck, Pathfinders. Good luck. Bye, Pathfolk. Bye. Goodbye. Find the Path Ventures is an officially licensed partner of Paizo Incorporated. Hollow's Last Hope is copyright 2007. Hollow's Last Hope and the Game Mastery module line are trademarks of Paizo. All Game Mastery images are property of Paizo and used with permission.